Good morning. It is Friday, August 20th. Welcome to the morning medical update. We are turning away transfers daily. That means there are people who need our help. They need our medical care, and we simply do not have the space or the staff to treat them. So today we are joined by Dr. Tim Williamson, physician and also vice president of quality and safety. He joins us to talk more about transfer requests and how we are handling the spike in patients and lack of staff really everywhere. But first, Dr. Data Hawkinson joins us on this Friday with our numbers. Good morning to you. Hi. Hi. Uh, numbers are holding steady. Again, we've been in that kind of mid 50s, 50s for acute infections. Today, we do have 56 active infections with 20 in the ICU, 13 on the ventilator, and 36 in that recovery period. I think the big number here that we're looking at is that only one of these 56 active infections is vaccinated. Um, now, I wouldn't get too uh, elated about that. It is just one data point. Obviously, what we have seen at our health system is that anywhere from um, 85 to 90 percent of the people that are coming in are unvaccinated. So this is a certainly a lower number for our fully vaccinated, but, but I think it's good and I think it still would illustrate and be consistent with what the rest of the nation is seeing. And that is the vast majority of those people that are coming into the hospital are unvaccinated. Hayes has 17 total uh, patients with 13 active and four in that recovery period. And then we also see Children's Mercy has increased uh, by four over the last 24 hours. They have 18 positive inpatients uh, at their facility as well. All right, Doc Hawk, thanks for that update yeah. today. Do we have any reporter questions on the line? Okay, I do have one from Matt over at KMBC, and he is asking a question, Dr. Hawkinson, that we do talk about quite often, but if you could just go over the advice that you're giving J&J &J vaccine recipients when it comes to that booster yeah. dose, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to get that mRNA if they've received the J&J? &J? Yeah, so there's a lot of questions there. Uh, I'll, we had an email that I sent out. Um, there was a question about that we were discussing with some of the physicians and executives yesterday, and actually walking in was talking to an executive as well, uh, one of our other employees who knows people who got J&J, &J, and certainly that is a big question. We know that the people who did receive the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine kind of do feel left out a little bit just because there is a paucity. There is only a little bit of data about that and certainly not to the extent or the duration because uh, it hasn't been out as long. What we are expecting and what I saw from the CDC is that within the next few weeks there should be more information about that, especially looking at durability of that um, protection that Johnson & Johnson vaccine provides. So the question would be, well, what will happen if they do offer or if it is recommended that you get an extra dose after Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Is it going to still be Johnson & Johnson vaccine or will they say switch and pivot to an mRNA vaccine? So that is just the information I don't have. I don't know if there's unpublished studies. Certainly we, we have a little bit of uh, information from the, the United Kingdom about AstraZeneca and Pfizer. So AstraZeneca is very very similar to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and then giving the Pfizer dosing. But overall, that is a large question, and I think what we have been told to expect is that within the next few weeks, they will have more information for us, more guidance for us, for those of you that have received Johnson & Johnson vaccine. However, I would note that there were two recent publications from uh, MMWR, the CDC publication, looking at vaccine effectiveness and all of the vaccines that are currently used in the United States, the two mRNA vaccines and the Johnson & Johnson adenovirus vector vaccine, all look to continue to give very good efficacy uh, in protecting you from going to the hospital from severe disease and death. So right now, if you did get Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that is the main messaging, and that is supported by uh, pretty good evidence right now, and that includes two recent publications that were just published this week showing that um, even up to 24 weeks out or more, you still have very good protection against hospitalization, even if you receive Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Yeah, we, we hear a lot from those folks that they feel like they're kind of left in the dark with yeah. this information, but it's coming, so yeah. just be patient and wait. And I okay. think, um, and I, again, I think that the, uh, the two recent publications, I actually have them here, um, I think that should give some comfort to those people. Good. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. So it is follow-up Friday. We've got some great questions lined up for you. They've been coming in through the week, but send in your other questions now because we're going to try to get to some of those as well. And we're so glad to have Dr. Tim Williamson with us. We're going to talk patient transfers. And I just want to jump right in and talk, uh, Dr. Williamson, about our, our transfer center. And then let's just get straight to the numbers. What are those looking like? What have they looked like? 
Yeah, good morning. And so we're very fortunate that we have, <clears throat> for the past several years, had our own transfer center in-house. We used to outsource that, and we do that completely in-house now. We uh, historically have averaged about eight or 900 transfer requests uh, a month. Um, back in uh, November of last year, we hit a record height of 1,200 uh, requests. In July, we broke that. You can see a graphic here. We got 1,500 uh, requests in July. Uh, what has changed in July, uh, because of the volume, because of constraints on capacity, we could only, uh, we ended up not being able to take about a third of those, so we uh, weren't able to take um, uh, about a third of those. But in the past few weeks, it's been like nothing I've ever seen. And we uh, actually are currently on pace to be over 2,000 requests for the month, which is just the highest number that we've ever seen. Along with that, because of the very large number of requests, we are currently only uh, able to accept about 30% of those or slightly less. So we're having to decline maybe 70% of those just because of the share volume doesn't match up with you know our capacity. And that doesn't really probably take into account either the very large number of uh, calls we get that are just very quick. Uh, do, you, do you have this type of bed? This is really only those that we um, get information and, and, and go through the process, so which we can talk about in a second. But. Right, and turning away one patient has got to weigh really heavy on your team. So it is inc weighs incredibly health, uh, heavy, and that is a really great group of, of uh, nurses there. We have uh, uh, typically four nurses during the week and a couple on the weekends uh, who are interacting with the uh, referring facilities. Then we have physician advisors. Um, uh, there's three of us. I'm one that helps with that. Uh, and then um, a couple of others that um, uh, then what we try to do is we try to match uh, that patient's needs and we evaluate it in the real time every, you know, as they come in. Um, do we have what that patient needs? Do we have the capacity to take care of that patient? Do they have the capacity to take care of the patient where they're at? and then try to match all of those things up. And it weighs really heavy when we have to say no because we know that patient will likely remain at that facility because everyone in the metro area, everyone across um, Kansas and Missouri, and really across a good part of the U.S. is in the same place. Well, it's really concerning when I hear you say, I've never seen anything like this before. That's, that's very scary. So uh, how often are we evaluating this? I mean, I would imagine 24 hours in a day, you're, you're doing this really up to the minute, right? We, we, we're doing it in real time. We're doing it minute by minute. We have uh, constant updates in terms of our capacity. But really, every single call comes in. We, we match that with our capacity at the moment. And so it is a very fluid situation. Uh, what things look like at 8 in the morning may be different at 4 in the afternoon, which may be different at midnight. And mm -hmm. so uh, it changes very rapidly. Other hospitals having the same issue? Yeah, absolutely. And so um, uh, pretty much to my knowledge, all of the hospitals in the metro area uh, are, are constrained uh, right now by capacity. And it, it goes back a little bit to the, the numbers that Dr. Hawkinson shared. Um, I think every hospital's numbers would be higher if we were able to accept all of the requests that we get. And, and those requests are coming, and, and again, it's not limited to us, not only from Kansas and Missouri, but we have gotten requests from New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, South Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Georgia, and, and Iowa, and probably others. So we've gotten requests from all over the, the, the country. So, and you haven't really seen that before? No. Lately, no, certainly. Uh, you know, we saw uh, probably the closest we came to this was back in uh, November and December when we had the surge back then and, and um, thought that was record numbers uh, back then and it was back then, but this surpasses that. And I, you know, I've been in healthcare about 30 years now and I've not seen anything like yeah, this. You've seen it all up until now, right? Well, I thought I, thought I had. Right, you thought you did. So a, a question people often ask, us is because we're a large health system. People rely on us to take those transfers. So when we deal with the staffing issue, we have very stressed out, tired staff. They've been doing this for a year and a half. How are we balancing that out when we talk about tired staff, added patients, and making sure that our patients are getting the care we've always given? Yeah, absolutely. And so we do continue to focus on very high quality uh, care for our patients. We are very fortunate that we are uh, currently um, able to staff all of our beds, we're able to staff um, our brand new uh, unit that we opened uh, July 26th, and we're able to staff typically 
somewhere from two to three al alternate care areas. By this week, you know, that may be recovery areas or other uh, places that are, are meant for patient care, but they're not typically what we've, we've had to use. So we're able to staff it, but it really is hard on our staff. They're tired um, and they're stretched. And, um, but we know that we have to do everything we can to meet as much of the need as we can. Uh, some of the other hospitals have, have de definitely had been stretched on their staffing issues and, and not been able to, to, to staff all the beds. Um, and, and that leads to not being able to take patients as well. So if we don't slow what many are calling this freight train down, I have to ask you that question, kind of what keeps you up at night? What, yeah. what are your, your concerns? Yeah, so I, I'm, um, I'm not someone um, overly prone to worry, but I am, I'm worried about, um, you know, we may, be, we may be seeing some slowing or flattening of cases in, in Kansas and Missouri. But we also don't know the impact of some of the large gatherings. We don't know the impact of schools opening. And so I'm worried about what is yet to come and knowing that hospitals are already stretched. Uh, and I'm, I'm worried that we could see um, what we've seen in Texas and Florida um, and Mississippi and that hospitals just totally overwhelmed, um, tents being set up in parking garages. Um, you know, there, there, there's not much more, there's not any more give in the system right now. Right. And, and I'm, you know, globally. And so additional um, strain on the system will come at the expense of having to really go into those sorts of uh, mass casualty modes like you know we've seen the tents in the garages yeah. in, in Mississippi and know. having to make choices and having to make choices in terms of who gets care and who doesn't right we don't want that and absolutely not. and this all comes back to one thing getting vaccinated what's your message about that yeah yeah the, the, the message message there is simple it's it's please 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 get vaccinated short term well not just short term wear your masks um, masks avoiding indoor gatherings will make the biggest difference in, in over the next few weeks but then absolutely you know uh, dr atkinson shared right now only one patient in our hospital is not vaccinated that will make the biggest difference long term in terms of how we turn this tide and um, um, and, and, and get out of this. All right, we're going to get to some community questions today. I want you to help me and Dr. Hawkinson answer some of Abs those if you would. Absolutely. Okay, so let's get to our first one. And again, keep sending your other ones in today. We're going to try to get to those. But if I'm vaccinated and I'm not immunocompromised, that's a good place to be. What is the risk of eating indoors at a restaurant? Dr. Hawkinson, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, what is your risk of indoors for what? getting exposed to the virus. Um, you know, at this point in time with the community spread, your risk of getting exposed to the virus is probably pretty high in those indoor situations, as Dr. Williamson had just mentioned. We know those high-risk areas where masks and distancing have the greatest evidence of providing the greatest benefit. So certainly being exposed and getting infected, it's pretty high risk to do that. Now, if you're fully vaccinated, is the question, what is my risk of getting disease and or going to the hospital? Um, what we have seen and kind of what I kind of brought up a little bit uh, earlier on is that we still see that if you're fully vaccinated, your chance of that whole spectrum of disease, but especially going to the hospital, having severe disease, remains significantly low or significantly improved if you are vaccinated. So I think you have to just weigh what are those risks and benefits that I want to do. Um, is there a high likelihood I will be exposed and get infected? Probably, uh, but what is the chance that I will get severe illness and have to go to the hospital if I'm not immune compromised and I'm vaccinated? It still remains quite a bit lower, significantly lower than if you're unvaccinated. Okay, so how serious are hospitalizations now compared to last year? Meaning how sick are the patients and what's the average length of stay? You know, globally, I'll say, um Patients are, are, are sicker, and what we're seeing is they're younger, um, and there are more requests for ECMO, which is a total heart-lung bypass, uh, which is kind of the, the very last resort in terms of supporting someone's life. And those requests uh, we're not only seeing in 20, 30, and 40-year-olds uh, for ECMO and heart-lung bypass. We're seeing them, uh, I know of at least three pregnant or recently pregnant patients in their 20s that have uh, needed that uh, in the metro area uh, just in the past uh, week. Uh, last week we had someone uh, in their 30s uh, pregnant. And so, you know, 
I don't remember seeing this degree of critically ill, pregnant, and immediately postpartum patients um, in, in the last really big, big surge we had. So yeah. it's, it's incredibly concerning. Delta is different. The Delta, Delta is different, yes. And the patients are different, yes. and the amount of sickness and length is different. It's what we've been saying. The next question is, my dad would like to have all his employees vaccinated, but has an employee who refuses to get the shot because he claims that he's allergic to intramuscular injections. Mm -hmm. Can you verify if that could be true? Yeah, again, I think if we're talking about an individual, it's very difficult to know the details of that individual and their health history. Uh, the question is, it's asked right here, um, intramuscular injections, I'm not really sure what that means. Um, people get injected all the time with different substances. Uh, all of the vaccines are really pretty different uh, in what their components are and their makeup and the platform that they use. But again, right now for the COVID-19 vaccines, there is no contraindication, really unless you've had an allergic reaction to one of those components, or if you had a serious allergic reaction to the first dose. Um, in speaking with our allergists and in looking at published reports about people who did get second doses, even after a reaction with the first, uh, there tended to be less reactions with that second dose as well. So I think without knowing the full details of that question, um, I'm skeptical of just in general somebody who is allergic to intramuscular doses. I registered yeah. for the Rock the Parkway Marathon back when I felt safe. Mm -hmm. I'm questioning whether I should participate now. I'm vaccinated, but my two children are not. What are your thoughts? I, I you know, any type of outdoor thing like that. I think the marathon itself is is likely safe, you know, out running in, in space. Uh, probably the, the bigger risks, even though that's outdoors, come when you're congregated um, either in activities or at the, you know, at the start line. So uh, I think if, if you're outdoors and mask when you're in the groups and you're, and you're um, trying to space as much as possible from the other participants, probably reasonably safe, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my, my worry would go back to more to any of that close congregation, yeah. even though it's outdoors. The volume. And don't you think people are having to kind of make those decisions? Mm -hmm. Something that they may have felt safe doing three months ago is different now. You know, we, we totally are uh, uh, frequently making those kind of reassessments mm -hmm. of, is it still safe to do this? And things that we planned even a month ago, maybe we, we reconsider now. And with Delta, it's important to make those reevaluations. Would you Absolutely. be running in that marathon, Dr. Hawkins? Yeah, said? I think so. I think okay. we've always promoted really being outdoors and doing things, um, especially in an active manner like that. But other things outdoors, such as we've seen people go to the beach um, or be out at the pool or just sitting in the park having a picnic, I think we've always encouraged that. Yep. You know, obviously, we'll say wear your sunscreen because we <laughs> want to keep our, our, our dermatology colleagues uh, in the mix as well. But be safe that way. But I think we've always really promoted and, and said that it's okay to be doing things outdoors, just as, as Dr. Williamson said. Um, I think it's maybe at the very beginning or at the end of those where people can tend to congregate um, fairly closely together. But I think even in those situations, you can still do that safely if you can still space, you know, eight, ten feet apart from people. I think you should be fine. Yeah, exercise sunshine. Yeah. That's good for your health, too. So yep. keep that in mind. Okay, let's talk air travel. Uh, air travel and planes have proven to be pretty safe, it seems. But are we noticing a change in the effects of mass travel now that Delta has arrived? Have we heard anything about that? You know, I, there are so many confounding factors. I think it's hard to point at any one thing as, as being uh, a, a big change. Um, I, I, I don't, my personal and Dr. Hawkinson's way in, I don't think uh, Travel has had a big impact because that is being done very safely with masks, and we know that the air handling systems on airplanes, for example, are, are very good. So, um, I, I think it's more the change in Delta. Delta is different, um, mm -hmm. and um, again, if I worry about anything, I worry about either um, indoor events or very large gatherings. Well, if social media is positive in any way at all, it's nice when people call out people on airplanes that aren't wearing masks. I mean, really, the airlines mm -hmm. haven't tolerated much, have they, Dr. Hawkinson? Because you've been traveling yeah. really since this started mm -hmm. here and there, and you, your, your masking and your eyewear, that's never really changed for you, and you felt pretty safe, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, even, you know, once I go through TSA, I tend to put on my eye protection as well, but um, luckily in those federal areas, uh, you need to have the masks on, on the planes, the airlines have been very good about that. Wear your mask. I would encourage everybody to get some sort of eye protection as well. I think that just adds another layer of protection. 
Uh, and then so certainly doing that once you get out of the airport and you're again you're outside go ahead and take off your mask and your eye protection um, but for that traveling whether it, it is air travel train bus masking and eye protection are very important and will uh, increase your risk uh, or sorry increase your chance of being protected and not getting infected uh, by uh, COVID uh, by SARS-CoV-2 specifically Delta right now is that is the predominant variant going around. Dr. Williamson, do we know what percentage of Kansas City area hospitals are Kansas City area residents? You know, it's a great question and I've not seen data on that. Okay. I would, my, my <clears throat> gut feeling is that the majority are still uh, Kansas City residents uh, with some mix of, you know, patients who have been transferred in from, from other areas. But uh, I've not seen, uh, I've not seen that data. Okay, we can check on that. But I mean, is it safe to assume that because we're you know, pumping the brakes on the transfers that we're taking people locally. Yeah, Is that what that you know, means? You know, um, absolutely. So in any given day, we have maybe 180 admissions, and if 14 of those come through the transfer center, I think it's fair to say, or 20, uh, I think it's fair to say that um, the bulk have come uh, from from the Kansas City metro area. So do Kansas City residents get priority then? If like there were two people that needed to be here and somebody's coming from far distance and someone lives here, do we get priority? You know, we don't um, look at it that way in terms of, you know, where do you live? The other thing people ask, which I think is fair, do we prioritize vaccination over non-vaccination? Mm -hmm. No, uh, we, we look at every single patient individually and go, are they getting what they need mm -hmm. where they're at? Sure. And can we provide it and do we have the capacity? And so we really try to not uh, focus on um, anything else above and beyond that. Dr. Hawkinson, anything to add? No. Okay, I have one for you though. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people who've had COVID and insist their natural immunity is all they need? Yeah. Uh, you know, the guidance continues to be even if you've had COVID-19, you should still get vaccinated, especially if you had uh, COVID-19, say, before the turn of the year, maybe before Alpha became prevalent, maybe before Delta came, became prevalent. That uh, boost, if you will, that you will get from being vaccinated will continue to expand those B cells and T cells and, and specify and create even more specific response and robust response uh, to SARS-CoV-2 should you come into contact with it again. Because we do know and understand that people who have had more mild uh, disease compared to those who had severe, less, uh, uh, more severe disease may have you know, decreased antibody levels, uh, therefore uh, maybe they won't have as much protection. How long does that uh, overall protection last? Again, we know that your body will still make those memory B cells and T cells, but getting vaccinated will help boost those responses in those specific uh, B cells and T cells as well. Dr. Hawkinson, do you think the big vaccine clinics will start to open back up again? You probably hope so, right? I, I think we <laughs> hope so. I think that, um, you know, again, the more people we can get vaccinated, whether you've had COVID-19 in the past, whether you haven't, the more people that we can get vaccinated, the better off we will all be, the better off you individually will be as well as your family. Because we know that the more people that are vaccinated, there is an indirect effect of uh, impacting and helping those who are, are unvaccinated or unable to get vaccinated as well by just overall protection throughout that community. Yeah, and to, and to build on that, we uh, are opening back up um, a smaller version of our vaccine clinic uh, here on the main campus. Um, part of the ongoing uh, challenge is staffing uh, for all hospitals to put on those really big uh, vaccine clinics like uh, we had before. We know there's going to be a need as uh, additional boosters are out there, so we will. Um, I, I do think you'll see some resurgence of vaccine clinics, but it may not be at the same uh, level that we saw uh, very early on when think, vaccines were available. And do you th well, that's what I was going to say. Do you think it's more of people wanting the booster than it is getting their first shot? Yeah. Uh, I, now, we have seen with the increase uh, in cases, uh, we're seeing particularly, I heard, in Oklahoma and somewhere else, maybe Louisiana, I forget, uh, we're starting to see a, an uptick in, in first-dose vaccination, so that's great. Uh, but I think it's uh, probably going to be more boosters than first-dose, but absolutely hope that it's first dose as well. Absolutely. Okay. So um, this uh, viewer says, I've been seeing articles that this pandemic is shifting to an endemic. Is this true? Would this be for the better or worse? Doc Hawk? Yeah. I mean, I think here it's all going to be speculation and expert opinion. But, you know, seeing what we have over the past 
18 months or so, and just understanding how coronavirus spreads, how easily it spreads from one person to another. I think that, you know, it will be global, and I think it will continue to be in our communities in some manner uh, for the foreseeable future. Now, what is that? What, what does that look like? I think that all depends on our behavior as a community or whatever community you may be living in. And by that, I mean how many people are going to be vaccinated. What we have continued to say now for the past several weeks, especially with the surge in Delta variant, is that this is really becoming a pandemic of two populations, and that is unvaccinated and vaccinated. So I think we have to understand that, and what do we want that to look like? If it's a pandemic of the vaccinated, and if everybody's vaccinated, then you will have overall more health in your community. You will have less hospital capacity issues. You will have less uh, businesses shutting down or quarantining because people are out uh, from work because they are too ill from COVID-19. So I think for the foreseeable future, yes, coronavirus will be with us in some manner, but what do we want that to look like? And I think that breaks down to every individual and every community to really understand how they want that to go. And I don't know if Tim has any comments on that either. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And very early on in the pandemic, one of my patients was in the ICU with H1N1. And if you remember back many years ago, that was uh, not nearly the level of concern uh, COVID has been, but um, it, it became in endemic and not the threat to the community that it was at the very beginning. And she did fine, she got through it. Um, and it was just a little bit of a reminder to me that we, you know, we can get through this and this can become something that's more in the background, but that, um, uh, you know, that there is, there is hope on the other side right. of this. But we are not there yet. We are not there yet. Okay. So last follow-up question, Dr. Hawkinson, mm -hmm. if I can smell through my mask, does that mean it's not working? Should I double up? No, I don't believe so. Again, the main issues from CDC guidance of anything about double masking consists of a surgical mask covered by a cloth mask. That is what was tested. That is what they recommend. But really in their recommendations is that you have uh, a better fit of the mask, whether that's a cloth mask or a surgical mask that you can buy at the grocery store or the pharmacy or even any of the K95, N95 masks that you can buy out at other places like the hardware store. So I don't believe that just because you can smell through it uh, that it uh, – means that it's not working. Again, what we're talking about are those respiratory droplets. Uh, we don't want to get into semantics about size, but just understand that those molecules that you're smelling from, uh, whether, whether you're outdoors and you smell fragrances of, of plants or anything, or if you're cooking, remember, those are much, much smaller than any of the droplets that may be uh, collected or uh, filtered out by that mask. And certainly, you know, Dr. Williamson with his uh, expertise in pulmonary medicine may have, again, more thoughts on that as well. Uh, my, <laughs> my only thought is actually a very simple one and as, as make sure it's over your nose. Um, yeah. I, I can't tell you how nuts it drives healthcare professionals to see it firmly protecting your chin. And so <laughs> unless, you know, it's not only over your mouth, your nose is also mm -hmm. connected to your lungs. Uh, mouth and nose, and yeah. and 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 that's where you're going to get your impact. So yeah. I think that's looking good, at the picture. A there. good point of clarification. Yeah. There you go. We're not talking about chin diapers here. We want the mask <laughs> over the nose and under the chin. Yeah. So yeah, if you're going to have that on, have it on right. If you have to wear it right. Not and you've always said wear it right. And just please, people, wear one mask. We'll take one mask. Yeah, We're not even absolutely. asking for two. We'll take one mask. Uh, people, get your first dose of vaccine. Yes before we have to worry about additional or third dosing. So it's, it's pretty simple. Very simple. Okay, so um, those are our follow-up questions. My girl, Marsha, is grabbing some great questions from all of you offline this morning. So I'm gonna just jump in with those right now. Okay, so Sean wants to know, Dr. Williamson, what type of patients do other hospitals need to transfer here to our health system? What, what kind of patients? Yeah, I think it totally depends on the size and capabilities of that hospital. So a critical access hospital that may have four beds and no ICU, they, they have to transfer uh, quite, quite a bit of stuff, you know, heart attacks and um, people who need more than a certain amount of oxygen or anyone on life support. 
other large hospitals in the metro area may just only need to transfer if they need uh, ECMO or that heart-lung bypass and don't have it themselves. So it really depends on the size and capabilities of, of the hospital that's asking. And do we know if the bulk of transfer patients are COVID or other care, or is it a mix, just mix it, of both? You never it, know. It's a mix. You know, I would say, and, and interestingly, when I talk about those transfer requests from all across the states, they're not necessarily COVID. Uh, some of them have been... Um, GI bleeding, you know, you know or um, heart attacks or other things. So um, it's a mix, and I, I wouldn't even say COVID is probably the majority of it, but it's certainly a fair amount but of it. But COVID increase in other areas is bumping other, you know, other a people out. Absolutely, That's and so you think uh, currently we have um, 90 patients, including our acute and our recovered patients. Those are 90 beds mm -hmm. that um, are being occupied by patients with COVID that... Um, that other illnesses can't, can't correct, correct. Take, take advantage of. So. Amy asks, she says, I've been tracking the COVID pandemic because of mm. my job. Most of the U.S. is red, but Nebraska, mm. we brought this up <laughs> earlier this week. What's going on with Nebraska? It's green. Yeah. What are they doing that we're not? Why I, is this? Is this a lack of reporting, high vaccination rates? It, what is that? What is up with Nebraska? Um, Dr. Hawkinson and I are both laughing, but yeah. and it depends on the heat map. But if you look at the New York Times yeah. heat map, it's white except for a couple yeah. of dots. And to my understanding, there has been really a mandate that only counties with 20,000 or more uh, residents report. And so mm -hmm. that's not a lot of counties in, in Nebraska. And, and so you're seeing primarily the metro areas like Lincoln and Omaha reporting. And I don't know, how yeah. do you have other? Yeah, I mean, is. I think that the uh, professional medical answer is it's not a medical issue. It's more of a reporting yeah. political issue. Um, so. so we shouldn't all uh, we shouldn't relocate move, we to shouldn't Nebraska. We should move to, to Nebraska okay. right now. And, and this was really impressive for those of you who have followed this heat map. It started off fairly light yellow, and it was like a drop of ink was dropped kind of in, in uh, south-central Missouri, and it just spread down through uh, the states that you see there. Um, yeah, we've been pulling this up daily. It's yeah. pretty concerning. Um, Joanne asked, what do you tell people that say people die every day? Um, is COVID being overblown? Um, no. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, um, the, the short answer is no. Um, yeah, people uh, die every day. What we don't want is uh, preventable deaths. And we know that virtually now uh, COVID deaths are preventable. And um, we don't want that. And it's not being overblown. Dr. Hawkinson, what are your thoughts that people think this might be overblown? Yeah. I mean, I think that we have very good evidence about the excess deaths that have occurred since the time of the pandemic due to COVID or COVID-related mortality and death compared to uh, other years prior to the pandemic. And that absolutely would not bear out that statement. Uh, but also, I would like, you know, those people who say that to be consistent in their thoughts as well. Um, if they're saying, well, deaths occur every day, well, but... It, a lot of them are also probably saying, I'm not getting the vaccine because somebody died within two days. Well, if you understand that, there are uh, thousands of people that die every day, whether they get the vaccine or not, and the vaccine had nothing to do with it. So we just want con some consistency in what they're saying and what they're thinking. And if they are not going to get the vaccine because they think they're going to die, well, that's not consistent with their thought that people die every day because they've seen some reports of people who died within a day, within two days, within five days of getting the vaccine. But we know that's gonna happen in America because we know the population that we have, there are so many deaths every day or so many deaths within five days of getting the vaccine that has nothing to do with the vaccine. So I think it's just, it continues to be what we're seeing and people kind of talking out of two sides of their mouth and not being consistent in their thoughts and in their words. Uh, but the actual, uh, but the answer to that is no, there have been very good reports and data that show the excess deaths that have occurred because of COVID-19 that wouldn't otherwise have occurred um, if it wasn't here. Okay, I have a few questions about kids. And Ashley has a question. I don't know if either of you know, but I have to ask because it will lead into a couple other questions. But do we know the ages of the patients being hospitalized at Children's Mercy? They know they go up to 20, 21 years old, but I mean, are they seeing it under 12? That have not been vaccinated, or, or is it those question. being vaccinated? Our, and I, she will be on Monday to answer that, but I just didn't yeah. know because you, you it, know certainly we're seeing uh, 
throughout the country, kids uh, mm -hmm. down to the age of, of babies who yeah. are being hospitalized with this. And, and of course, currently uh, kids under the age of 12 can't be vaccinated. So I don't know the numbers at Children's Mercy. Uh, it will be great to get those on, on Monday. But it's it's clearly being seen throughout the country. So Rebecca says people's kiddos are popping up sick and parents are instantly testing them mm -hmm. and getting negatives. So should they just be keeping their kids home or waiting to test them to see if it's a positive? I think I think and, and yeah. Dana can can push back if he disagrees. I think testing is good because we want to capture that um, and, and often they're being tested for more than one thing. It's uh, RSV or other um, viral illnesses. Uh, but, but we want to know so that we can have the proper containment measures in terms of quarantine and, and isolation and stuff. And so um, I, I think testing is, is absolutely good. Yeah, I, I do too. I absolutely do. You know, I think what we saw earlier on uh, with the ancestral strain, of SARS-CoV-2 now with Delta, I think the consistent messaging there is that you really do have the highest viral loads from one to two days prior to any symptoms to uh, you know one to two to three to four days after symptoms start. So if you do go get tested, once you start having symptoms, you will have the highest chance or the highest sensitivity for uh, becoming positive. Um, so I think testing is good and, and continue to do it. I am certainly thankful that my children are of age to get the vaccine they have gotten the vaccine but i think overall yeah if your child has symptoms understanding what the spread of covid 19 is in our community they should absolutely get tested when they do have symptoms and i'm very thankful i just want um, my kids also both vaccinated yeah. um, but that also prompts another comment of just please 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 if your child is sick Please don't take them to child care uh, or, or daycare or school. And if you're sick, please don't go to work. Um, and we have seen some, starting to see some outbreaks in the community in, in uh, daycare situations. So, um, you know, underscore, please don't, please don't go anywhere if you're sick. All right, I'm only bringing this up because you both brought up your kids. And I know neither of you are clinical psychologists, but I'm going to ask you <laughs> this anyway. Jennifer says, are children emotionally damaged by wearing masks in school? I don't think so. Uh, but some people in her school believe so. I know you two can only speak from your own yeah. dad experience. Are your kids well, psychologically or emotionally damaged by wearing masks? That's not true. You know, have, ha, I, no, how the, are your kids doing? They're, you know, they're they're good. They're resilient, and uh, they've managed this whole uh, this whole pandemic in just an, an amazing way. And uh, you know, we talk to a lot of different folks who are parents of all different ages, and 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 their kids are um, doing fine with the mass. Of course, being home during the time that they had to be home was tough, and not doing some of the activities for when they couldn't do their activities was tough. Uh, but, you know, in terms of going to school, wearing a mask, I, I, I think most kids are, yeah. from everything I've heard, are yeah. doing Dr. just Hawkinson, fine. Dr. Hawkinson, do, you, does your, do your kids seem emotionally different because you make them wear a mask? No, and, and I, I would agree with, with Tim, certainly. Um, you know, the question was, and it was stated as a lot of parents think that their kids are emotionally harmed by this. Uh, it's, a, it's a good opinion and a good thought, but that is not supported by the cons consistent evidence nor the consistent messaging from uh, pediatrics groups, whether that's the American Academy of Pediatrics, psychology groups, psychiatric groups. Uh, that certainly would not be supported by the consistent evidence and data that children are harmed by mask wearing. Again, I think if you ask me, they're going to be more harmed by uh, continuing to have to be home quarantine, yeah. doing online learning, and being isolated than they are wearing a mask and being able to interact with their, uh, their classmates at school. And again, once you're outside on the playground and, and, and you're doing those things, you know, I don't think you need a mask on at those situations, but certainly in the classroom. Uh, so the ultimate answer is no, I don't think there's any harm uh, psychologically. More harm comes from when they are isolated at home. You know, back to that American Academy of Pediatrics, they are the experts in kids, yeah. and they are the experts of keeping kids safe, and, yeah. and they recommend masks and vaccines, and um, I think keep coming back to them. These are, what, 70,000 people who are experts in kids, and entire focus is keeping our kids safe, and, and so we should listen to them. And I'd like to, to piggyback on that. I was in a meeting last week um, with about mask mandates for certain groups. Uh, and I said, you know, there is no group who cares more about children and does more research and dedicates their life and time to keeping children safe than the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is what they state masking should be done. Uh, one of the people said, 
well, I know some group that doesn't care or doesn't care as much and or cares more about their ch children than anybody, and that's the parent. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that parent just cares about that child. The American Academy of Pediatrics and those pediatric groups care about children's health as a whole. So again, they dedicate their life, their time to creating and, and uh, focusing on the safest uh, plans, protocols, and measures for children overall. Thank you both for that. Okay, so Chelsea wants to know, if someone wakes up with upper respiratory symptoms that mimic allergies, then they, they resolve those, but then the next day they have GI symptoms, should it just should they just isolate themselves or should they go ahead and be tested? I think people are now like, mm -hmm. do I test, do I not yeah. test? What are we doing with testing? Everything gets tested? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the safest thing to do. We just heard, you know, Tim say, if your child does have symptoms or, or you're you having symptoms, please don't go to work and spread it. Uh, there is ready, ready uh, testing available all over. There is good access to testing, whether it's at private pharmacies or minute clinics, whether it is at uh, private clinics. Certainly here at the health system, we have uh, ready access to testing. I think if there is any question, please go get tested. Anything to add, Dr. Williamson, as I'm nope. looking for another great question? No, I think that's <laughs> right. And um, yeah. there, there's even home, I don't, yeah, there there's are, even home actually. tests now that, you know, so for those kind of, is it allergies or not? Maybe that's a, a place for those. Okay, a couple more questions. Isaac wants to know, watching the Johnson County Commissioner meeting yesterday, I saw new case numbers in the region appear to be leveling off. How soon will this translate to hospital numbers? You know, um, great question. It's a great question, and we don't necessarily know if Delta will quite follow this, but in general, um, the um, hospitalizations have followed uh, case numbers by a couple of weeks, uh, and in general, deaths have followed hospitalizations by a few weeks. So, um, you know, we would love seeing um, leveling off of case numbers if that truly is happening, as long as it's not because we're doing fewer tests, and sometimes we've seen that as well. That we're not doing fewer tests, but in general, hospitalizations uh, follow a couple of weeks after cases. Yeah, I, I would agree, and I think we've said now for the past four to six to eight weeks, really, because of the point that Tim brought up, because people aren't testing. Maybe uh, I think the real bellwether is going to be what do our hospital numbers look like. So hopefully, we will start to see a trend at some point fairly soon. Uh, certainly, sooner is better uh, than later. Of a plateau of, of hospital active infections, and then, of course, that decrease. We'd like to get down to two like we were uh, recently, but I don't know when that will happen. All right, Jessica wants to know, why are the CDC's quarantine guidelines not updated to reflect Delta's transmissibility? Just fewer minutes, closer contact versus 10 to 15. Why not, since vaccinated can now transmit? Yeah. You know, again, I, I'm not clear on all the virology and the science behind some of this issue about transmissibility about two to four minutes versus 15. I think it's all a matter of, um, you know, we shouldn't really get into semantics, but if you encounter a large viral load, whether you're in a small enclosed space with somebody who may have it, uh, such as a, a small room in a restaurant, you don't need to be in there for 15 minutes, obviously, if they are in that pre-symptomatic uh, or early stage, they can still transmit a lot of virus. Um, so I, I don't think we really understand the science, and that isn't necessarily what is guiding the quarantine. Um, I, I don't think we need to see an updated quarantine rule. I think if you are quarantining because you have been exposed, then you really should develop symptoms within that time. But again, we also know that the guidance for quarantine allows you to test after a certain number of days to get out of quarantine a little bit earlier. And certainly we know now that if you are exposed and you're fully vaccinated, it is recommended to go get tested three to five days after that exposure as well. Okay, a couple quick ones. Is it safe to get a haircut? Now, keep in mind, this is the Delta is different mindset. Marilyn says her and her stylist are both vaccinated, but no one else has a mask on. So how do you know who's got what, who's vaccinated? What do you do? What's your recommendation? I <clears throat> I need a haircut, I, but my, uh, I, I, I think it's, I think it's safe if certainly everyone's vaccinated and I do, and you're wearing a mask and ideally your stylist is wearing a mask and so on the on the Missouri side I think uh, uh, there are many places do have the the mask mandate and the stylists are wearing them but um, I I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask your stylist to put on a mask. Yeah. You got your haircut the other day. Yeah. What did you do? I mean, I, is it safe? <laughs> Depends who's cutting your hair and if they're mad at you or not. <laughs> um, but I think what we saw early on from some of those early reports was that 
when you have both parties that are masked, the stylist and the client, that really there is a, a significant reduction in the ability to, to transmit that disease to that other person. So I think if you and your stylist can both be masked, yeah, I believe it's safe, especially if you're vaccinated. Um, it's unclear whether this is a setting where it is a larger area where there are other people in there. Certainly she asked about um, if peop other people in that area are not masked. Um, you know, it may be a little bit more risky, but certainly I think if we're talking about just the relationship with you and your, your stylus, uh, if you are both masked, that, that is certainly, I believe, a, a, a much safer uh, environment and a safer um, scenario there than if just one of you are masked. Or, um, you know, if you can get to that area where just the two of you are, where there aren't, aren't other people who are not masked, that would certainly be safer as well. Re really, really quick. A lot of times people frame this as safe or not safe, and it's yeah. a continuum. It's it is. how many layers of protection mm -hmm. can you put in there? How safe can you make it in the continuum? So you're not growing your hair out? I, That's what I'm going to do? I'm not. I'm, I'm not going for a ponytail. I'm all <laughs> no man bun for you. No man bun. Okay, so um, Craig is going to get the last question, but again, I just want to remind everyone who have questions about their kids. Angela Myers from Children's Mercy will be on Monday, so we will save some of those questions, and I'll hold on to the other ones to get to next week. Okay, so Craig is asking a question that we've, we've talked about before, but Dr. Williamson, I want to get your thoughts. If vaccinated people can still catch and spread COVID, is it safe to say we just simply cannot reach herd immunity? It's such a good question. I get why people uh, ask it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and Dana may actually be able to approach this better. So um, I don't know that we'll ever get to the point where herd immunity eradicates COVID. We can get to the point, though, where we can safely uh, safely operate, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a new world where uh, everyone's not having to wear masks, um, et cetera. So um, I, I think um, whether we get to what we initially were calling herd immunity to the point that COVID goes away, probably not. But can we get to a place where enough people are vaccinated that everyone is safe? Yes, I think we can. I know. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think it goes back to um, more of that population uh, issue, and that's what we're talking about with herd immunity or population immunity. You know, what are we looking to try and do? Are we looking to stop infection? I think it's very difficult to stop infection. Uh, infection is really just that virus coming into contact with your cells and causing an immune reaction in your body, essentially. So what are we looking to stop? We are looking to stop um, the whole spectrum of COVID-19 disease, but especially the, that disease that sends you to the hospital, that keeps you in the hospital for 10 or 14 days, that puts you in the ICU for severe disease. Um, so I think in, in that way, yeah, we can, we can get back to normal. That's what vaccine is doing. The vaccine continues to provide uh, good protection for you uh, against going to the hospital, severe disease and death. We know obviously that is okay and that is what we're looking for as far as efficacy and that is why we are using the vaccine is to protect against that so that our hospitals are not overwhelmed so that we have beds when you come to the emergency department for a heart attack or if you fell and broke your leg or a stroke. Those things that we have normally treated now that we find it hard or a lot of hospitals as we have heard find it hard to treat because they are overwhelmed with COVID-19. If you uh, are otherwise needing a ventilator for some other reason, they aren't all taken up because uh, of our COVID-19 census. If you're needing those vital drugs uh, that aren't all taken up because of capacity issues and drug shortage issues because of COVID-19. So that is the goal of the vaccination. And the vaccinations, even at this time point, continue to protect us against that. And that's why uh, it is so important to continue vaccination as we have just seen and continue to, uh, to, to give that message that the majority, the vast majority of the people here in our community and also around the nation are unvaccinated for going to the hospital. So please continue to get vaccinated. We know that with vaccination, we can overall reduce our hospital numbers. We can overall keep the community healthy. And we know that when the community is healthy, we can continue to have a healthy economy and continue to do those things that we'd like to do. So I hear you both saying that through the vaccine, we can have a time where we hear of a COVID death is very, very rare, correct? Absolutely. All right. Dr. Williamson, I'm so glad you sat with me today. Good Thanks to for, see you. Thanks for having I, me. But I want some of your final thoughts before we head into the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
So we're seeing two things. We're seeing a healthcare system in crisis across the U.S. and, and in the metro uh, region as well. And we're seeing uh, preventable hospitalizations and deaths. And when we talk deaths, these are not, I'm not meaning to be morbid, but these are not quick deaths. And these are in younger people and they're protracted weeks in the ICU um, without your loved ones. The, this is not, um, and, and these are preventable. And so we just cannot stress enough, please get vaccinated, please wear your mask, and um, and not only for yourself, but for your kids, excuse me, for your kids, for your family. Um, and, and, and then we can get to a point where we, you know, we're keeping our economy open, we're uh, getting back doing the things we want to do. All right, and it's not morbid, you're just keeping it real, we appreciate yeah. that. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And Dr. Hawkinson, set us, send us out into the weekend with some words of wisdom. Yeah, go get vaccinated, and, and if you can, like we said, spend time outdoors whether that's walking or running in a race, uh, going out to the park, enjoy the weather while we can. Um, but And please uh, you know, keep yourself and your, your family and your loved ones protected. Thank you both as always. And thank you all for being with us on this Friday. We know that Delta is different, but how does it impact our children? We know a lot of you have questions. So we are back on Monday with Dr. Angela Myers from Children's Mercy. We're gonna answer your questions and concerns as children are back in the classroom, some masked, some not, and the challenges we face as COVID cases continue to climb in our area and our region. That is Monday starting at eight, but we leave you with this video, a reminder of exactly what we have been talking about this morning. Delta is fast and furious, and it's affecting hospitals, patients, and staff across the country and right here in Kansas City. So please stay safe this weekend and get vaccinated. The Delta variant is just so much more transmissible. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a different disease. We got calls from Mississippi, Georgia, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma about taking patients. But we can't take anybody. I think we're in trouble. I said once before last fall that we were on fire, and I think we're on fire again. And I think the problem is that we don't have enough people vaccinated, and then folks are not following the rules of infection prevention and control. This thing comes on like a freight train where before it took us five to six months to get to these high levels we saw last winter, now it's taken five to six weeks. This thing moves quickly through a community and it's very, very dangerous. But the spread is largely in younger people. You go through these ICU units and unlike last winter, where you saw mostly elderly folks, now you're seeing people age 18, 20, 25, 30. We're gonna to have to take control of the mitigation steps, whether that's face masking, whether that's getting the vaccine, whether that's social distancing, you know, when appropriate, getting everyone to really take this seriously so that we can get this under control. I don't think we're getting enough traction out there. It doesn't feel like people are really listening. They got so much COVID fatigue that all the desire to pitch it at the beginning, people are just tired of it. But I'll tell you what, if you wanna see tiredness, you wanna see exhaustion, go look in the eyes of the nursing staff right now. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites Podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.